Not just the people that think I'm okay. <laughs> I, I know what it's like out there, and I, I, I couldn't be more hopeful that, that, that it's going to get a lot better, and it's going to get a lot better if we have a governor in town there. So. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. I want to thank my friend Tim for for his help, and he's been wonderful. It's great to travel around Rock County with Tim Cohen. That's all I got to say. And Eddie George is here, who's doing a great job in the State Assembly as well. So I want to thank you both for being here and for your help. And I want to thank all of you for coming out on, on a, a Thursday morning where you could be doing all sorts of things that may be more interesting. But, but this is something I think that's important to our state. I, and I want to just take a couple minutes and talk to you about exactly why I'm doing this and why I think that this is such an important time for the state of Wisconsin. And it really goes back to February of 2011. And February 2011, you may recall, was a great, great month because that was the month that the Packers won the Super Bowl. Yeah. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful weekend. And I actually had the opportunity. Uh, I got invited out to the White House with my son, my 18-year-old son, to watch the Packers game and watch them win. And my only advice to you about that is if you're ever invited to the White House to watch the Super Bowl, you should go. <laughs> a lot of fun, a lot of fun, especially when the Packers win. Uh, but we flew back the next morning, and unknown to me, and unknown to anybody else really in this state, there was something that was going on that was literally changing the history of this state. That day, the day after the Super Bowl. Because that was the day that Scott Walker was meeting with his cabinet, and he was telling them, and these are his words, these are not my words, he was telling them that he was getting ready to drop the bomb. And that was the phrase that he used to describe what he was about to do. And boy, was he correct. Because what he did when he dropped that bomb, by going after the collective bargaining for public employees, he started a civil war that has now lasted in this state for 16 months. For 16 months, this state has been divided. And it's been divided like I have never seen it divided before in my entire life. Because of what I have witnessed, and I would bet there are people in this room who have witnessed the same thing, where you have a situation where neighbors don't want to talk to neighbors about politics because it can get too ugly. Or coworkers can't discuss it because arguments break up. Or even relatives don't want to talk about politics because it's too divided. I even made this, these same comments about a week and a half ago when a woman came up to me and she said, don't forget wedding receptions. <laughs> and I was at wedding receptions last year, and every one of them broke out into an argument. And that's what's happened. That's what's happened. Because he's divided the state. And he's divided the state in a way that I think has been unhealthy. And I've been traveling around the state, and I will tell you this. No matter where I go, whether I'm talking to conservatives or liberals, Republicans or independents or Democrats, they're tired of it. They are tired of the division. And I am here today in Janesville to tell you that I will stop the Civil War. And we know what it was about. It, was, it started out. It started out. The, 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 the match that lit the fire, that started the prairie fire, was the collective bargaining. I will fight to restore collective bargaining rights for teachers and public employees because it's the right thing to do. I have to talk about my wife for a second, because my wife is a teacher. She taught for 12 years in the Milwaukee Public Schools, and she got laid off. And, and so we had a rough summer. She finally found a job in another school district. But my wife, for the first time in 21 years of marriage, I saw her rattle. And it wasn't, frankly, it wasn't about the payments to the health insurance. She didn't like that. It wasn't about the payments to the pension. She didn't like that. It wasn't exactly about the changes to collect the bargaining. She didn't like that. But she felt that her vocation, not her job, her vocation was under attack by Governor Walker. She felt that her vocation, what she chose to do with her life, was being demeaned by this man and this legislature. And she said, what do I tell young people who want to go into education? What do I tell them? What, what value does this governor put on education when he is going after us and, and coming in with the largest cuts in, in the history of this state. And so that's divided the state as well. But like any war, there are casualties. And the first casualties in Scott Walker's ideological civil war were clearly jobs. They were clearly jobs. 
And the reason I say that is because I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Scott Walker time and time and time again in 2010. And I heard him talk about how he was going to create 250,000 jobs, 250,000 jobs, 250,000 jobs. That's what his focus was going to be. He never once mentioned, never once mentioned that he was going to go after workers' rights. Never once in that entire campaign. But then we get to 2011 in February. And I can tell you this because I'm a mayor, I'm an executive, and I understand that when you're in that position of authority, you have only so much time, you have only so much political capital, and you make a conscious decision where you're going to put your time, your energy, and your political capital. And in that, that fateful time in February, he made that decision. It was a fork in the road. And he could have done what he said he was going to do in the campaign which was to focus on creating 250,000 jobs. Or he could do what he had never mentioned, and that is start this ideological civil war. We all know the route that he chose. He chose to start the war. So what happened? What happened? And it wasn't just the war on collective bargaining. It was a war on clean energy, on the environment in general. It was a war on education, education funding. I can tell you Milwaukee got the largest cut it ever had gotten from the state government. It was a war on women and the attacks on, on, on the equal pay for equal work. It was the attacks on women for women who want to make their health care decisions in consultation with their physician about some of the most difficult and intimate issues they face in their lives. I'll tell you what I want. I want a woman to make those decisions herself. I want her to be able to make those decisions in consultation with her health care provider and not in consultation with her state legislator. And I want to focus on jobs here because this is really what this is going to end up being all about. Because in 2011, under Scott Walker, this state, this is not an applause line because it's too serious, this state lost more jobs than any other state in this country. We have been looking, and I have not been able to find ever, ever a time when Wisconsin had the worst job record in this country. Ever. We have looked back a couple decades, and I said to my staff, look further back, look further back. This may have been the only time in the history of this state where we lost more jobs than any other state. And it continued into 2012, because of between March 2011 and March 2012, Wisconsin was the only state, the only state in this country that lost jobs. Now, why did that happen? Well, again, you had a governor that was far more intent on, on becoming the poster boy for the conservative movement in this country. That's what his goal was. And he has succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. He leaves this state and he goes to Texas and Oklahoma, and he's a rock star. The conservative right wing just loves this guy. They love him. And he's out there talking about how he was able to go after worker rights here in Wisconsin. And what's happened while well, he's been gone? Let's fast forward to January of this year. Because he had two economic development initiatives. He had the venture capital initiative and he had the mining initiative. Let's look at what happened to both of those bills. Venture capital. There was a fight between the Republicans, not the Democrats, the Republicans in the Assembly and the Republicans in the Senate. I will tell you what a good executive would have done. He would have brought them into his office or her office, and he would have sat down and he would have said, this is a priority for me, let's figure out what the deal is, and let's move forward. He never did it. He never did it. No kidding, when he's out of state all the time. He, said, exactly he's the right. money. He was gone. He was gone. He never did it. The mining bill, very controversial. Probably people in this room disagree on the mining bill. But an executive who wanted to have something happen, if that was his priority, he would have brought the environmentalists in, he would have brought the Indians in, he would have brought the, the, uh, the small business people in, he would have brought the local officials in. He never did it. He never did it. Why? Because it's like, where's Waldo? He was traveling around the country giving these fundraising speeches. And, and look, I don't, I don't begrudge anybody who does something they want to do. And if he wants to travel this country and be the national spokesman for the far right, God bless him. Let him do it. But we're suffering in Wisconsin right now, and we're losing jobs because he's out there trying to make a national name for himself. And let's, it doesn't even stop there. Let's look at this week, this week alone. Monday, the financial reports come out, and it was staggering. It was staggering 
He raised $13 million in three and a half months. And I know that there's a couple people here who've had a